All right, Dr. Mark, we're ready to start. We'll welcome everybody. Erev Tov, I know you always like to say the date, but uh, February 6, 2023, the first of our new series, Letters of the Rub, that Dr. Shapiro has discovered and uh, he'll share with us over the next number of weeks. And I want to thank uh, Rabbi Mayor, Mayor Bruckheimer for sponsoring this evening's shear. As you may have heard, his uh, his grandson got married last week. At Svi Silver to Rivka Grobe. We want to wish him Mazel Tov. Have many happy occasions. All have many happy occasions. And thank you for uh, sharing your simcha with all of us. Okay, Dr. Shapiro, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. And uh, hold on, let me get my other computer set here. Um, as... Uh, Rabbi mentioned we're starting a new series here. Uh, I'll give an introduction and I'll explain uh, what uh, led me to this. And um, I see that uh, we have uh, a nice crowd here. So uh, people are interested in the letters of the Rav. But uh, although it is a new series, uh, I don't think our regulars will uh, be upset. I do have a few comments still from last week. So I'll say that and then we'll begin. But uh, is Rabbi uh, Hartman with us? Um, because I want to thank, I mean, he reminded me of uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik's uh, doctoral dissertation uh, subject. I always forget whether it's Max Scheller who he wrote about, but here I have a copy of it. I got a copy many years ago. Here it is. Uh, and uh, you see it's uh, Joseph Soloveitchik. I can send anyone this if you read German. It's not very long, uh, but uh, it's, it says from Prujana. That's Prujan. That's uh, his uh, father was the rabbi there. Uh, no, his father was the rabbi in. Uh, uh, that's where his uh, mother, his uh, grandfather was, uh, right? I forget now as well. Wait a second. Uh, he, his father was in Rasain and Chasovit. So why he calls it Prajan, that's from his mother's side. I'm not sure. Maybe it has something to do with the politics. Uh, that's sort of uh, Leal Prajaner, the uh, uh, Leal Feinstein. And it says the, the oral exam is on the 24th of July, and the date of promotion is the 10th of December. In Germany, you had to publish your dissertation. You just would take it and you'd find a, uh, a little publisher. Now, um, I'll get back to, well, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll talk about uh, my archives uh, and the things I find and how I came to the letters. But one of the very first things I found was uh, when it was still East Germany, they found from the University of Berlin all of Soloveitchik's uh, materials, his um his uh, the evaluations, uh, letters of his, evaluations from his professors, his diploma even. And um, I, I learned also then not to give my stuff away because uh, um, Manfred, I gave it to Manfred Lehman and you could read his uh, article, uh, it's online, it was in the Algemeiner Journal, uh, rewriting the biography of the Rav. And it's a whole thing there, but I'm never mentioned. And yet every, I, I gave it to him because I had met him and he asked me, he never told me he was going to publish it. He published it without mentioning me. He even says um, at the bottom here, um, the Rubs the poem on Latin. Yeah, he says the fact that this, that his information is still housed in Berlin where I got the copy, which is not true. I gave him the copy. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> I was a kid then. And uh, what did I know? I gave him this stuff. I thought uh, that I'd get some covod. He'd write in the Algemeiner about me. Uh, and something in it. So now I, uh, that was my, the, the first example of things I discovered. And I'll tell you all about what I discovered and how I came to the letters. But uh, I have all these things and uh, I can talk about them as well. But I, I want to share a few other things uh, with you just before we begin, because they're related to last week. First, we spoke about the pioneer. And actually, those who are with me, I took out in the audio the, the comments that we all heard, because I don't think it should be on uh, for um, Medoros. But uh, here's from the Jewish Observer in the 1960s, 65. And remember, there's no Hashkacha on the pioneer. And it says here, now they got kosher meat, chal Yisrael, so it's coming in. Notice it says the new pool... Um, uh, $100,000 Tropicana pool with three decks for sunning, relaxing. Now, I want to tell you that there was no such thing as separate swimming then, even though this was the hotel that all the Godoli went to. The, the concept didn't even exist. And I knew that, and I heard that from the uh, the grandson. But then I showed him the ad, and I said to him, but no, they did have indoors. They did have separate swimming. Notice it says health club, steam room, indoor swimming pool, separate hours for men and women. Just not on the outside. Of course, today they wouldn't go to the 
place, even if it was outside. But uh, so he replied to me as follows that I'm actually it's incorrect that uh, he says the indoor pool was part of the health club. It was very Russian, no bathing suits. So that's why uh, at the Pioneer, uh, it was uh, uh, separate swimming. Now, we got why we get into the Pioneer, which some of you remembered well, it was because I was speaking about uh, places that uh, don't have Hashgacha, and yet everyone trusted them. And uh, I spoke about... Uh, I spoke about Simcha by the Sea. I spoke about this place in the Catskills into the 80s. But I thought that this was uh, part of the, the lost history of American Orthodoxy, that other than Chabad, no one today could do this. It would be impossible. And uh, I mentioned how there's Taka Note now in cities and Rabbi Yonah Reis in the latest Journal of Hawking of Society talks about how this is absolutely forbidden. You can't do it. And, uh, and not that they made Taka Note, and now it's forbidden, but basically that it's forbidden. That's why they made the Taka Note. Uh, uh, I want to show you something which I heard from Tzvi. He contacted me, and then I confirmed it, which I had no idea about. Those in Brooklyn might know this place, Lieberman's Dairy Luncheonette, which I'm told that basically everyone eats there, including the Hasidim, although he said some Hasidim won't. This, as we speak now, in February of 2023, this place is not under Hashkaka. There is no Hashkaka. And everyone eats in this place, uh, in Borough Park. But what makes it incredible, I think even more incredible, maybe this is the reason why, as he says, not all Hasidim will eat there, but most do, is it's run by a modern Orthodox couple from Staten Island. Uh, I think we have their picture here. Uh, maybe not. Uh, maybe one of the other ants had it, had their picture in it. But this is a place you can go there. And uh, so it's not ancient history. It's, not, it's in Borough Park as we speak. And uh, so... Uh, I see it's not only uh, Chabad. You still have it, a place. It's, like it's a vestige of old Borough Park. That is correct. Yes. And it's it's been grandfathered in, I guess you could say. <laughs> so next time I'm in Borough Park, uh, I'm going to have to go check it out. My son, Amir Tzashem, uh, one of our listeners, uh, who's a Rav and a Dayan, he's actually hosting my son this Shabbos uh, and another YU guy and friend of my son yes. in Borough Park. So maybe uh, they can go uh, check it out. Uh, so what's the, well, I was thinking about this because this reminded me of something. Uh, let me uh, close this for a second. Um, this reminded me of something because uh, we're going to deal later with Rabbi Sorrell, with uh, the Musser movement, and Rabbi Sorrell Salanter actually deals with this. In his famous Igeras HaMusar, he says as follows. He gives an example of what the problem of uh, Jews in his day, 19th century Europe, was, and he says that... Um, he speaks with people, mochre basar kasher. That is, it wasn't just that you had people who would bring the chicken to the shochet and he checked it and you go home. There were people there, shochtim, who also shechted a bunch of chickens and then you went in and you'd buy it from them. And they didn't have mashkiach. Oh, they, they, the mashkiach was the rav who knew how they knew how to shecht. And um, and he had to show, they show them their knives. Uh, but Rabbi Shol Salanter said that, and he, he says that no one would dream that if any of these shochtim, the the, the mochre basar kasher, uh, maybe if the shochet checked it, sometimes he'd sell it to someone and they prepare it to sell. He says that um, it would never happen, chalila, it would never arise. It would never occur to anyone who's selling kosher meat not to ask if a problem, if when they're looking, preparing the food, they find a chashash trefos, be'evarim apnimiyim, they would immediately go to the Rav and ask a Shaila. In other words, there wasn't a Mashkiach in the store, and there wasn't a Mashkiach bin Yotzer Neknas. But it was understood, and this is the mentality why you didn't need a Mashkiach, because these are religious people, Shechting, and they know that they would immediately go to the, the Rav to ask a Shaila, even if he's going to lose a lot of money, there was never a Chashash. The Chalil that he would Hakshil uh, Sisral. So you didn't need Hashkaka, you didn't need Mashkiachim because there never was a Havamina thought that someone, remember, this is someone selling the meat to the people, but if in preparing it he sees a problem, there's not, today we have, a, you can have a Magid Shir of Dafyomi and Munsi who could sell Tarfus, Mamish Tarfus, uh, not even a suffix on it. And But Shisho Salantra says, 
it would never even occur. So you can always rely on these people. But then he says, but the problem is, is that when it comes to masa umat, and it's the opposite, that is monetary things. That's the whole point. He says that uh, when it comes to ritual things, we can rely 100% on people. But when it comes to monetary matters and Lashon Hara and all that, then all of a sudden, uh, they're not from anymore. And that's what uh, really is the basis for Yeris HaMusar, why you need a Musar movement, because the Jews have split the Torah. They've created. They've turned the Torah into uh, ritualism. And that is, and they're very mockpit on the ritual, but on the other parts, they're not mockpit at all. But I just find it's relevant to this issue. We spoke about so much about uh, the Hashkachas because there's so Salatra testifies that uh, we don't need to worry about this because no, they never would uh, try to take advantage of someone. Uh, and uh, but ironically, when it comes to other areas, uh, they they would. Uh, and finally, uh, that reminds me, I mean, today, if you see someone going into a place that's uh, maybe not up to the level of kosherists, and certainly if you saw someone going eating a McDonald's, he definitely would not regard him as orthodox, but uh, he could be serving time for 100 years in prison for uh, ripping everyone off, and yet when he gets out of prison... They'll give they'll have a whole uh, Sudas Mitzvah, Pignon Shulian for him. So uh, I think we might need Rabbi Sol Salanter again uh, to stress these matters. And one final thing before we begin with Rav um I, I feel I need to, to the, the great Rav Bernard Drachman. I, I need to, um, in fact, I didn't even show a, a picture of him. So let me hold on, show a picture of this um, great individual, a... Um, well, there's many pictures, but let me um, hold on. Uh, let me show you. Here you see uh, Bernard Drachman. That's the famous picture of him. You see him when he's uh, a little younger here. Uh, a very important uh, Orthodox figure. And I said, and I, I told the story that he was uh, given the money from Emmanuel to go uh, the Reform Temple to go study in Germany. And uh, he was studying actually in a school of theirs, that uh, like a high school. Um, but I said he came. He, his, I think I said he had reform background or something. It's really not true. He didn't have reform. He had um, uh, the way he describes his family. It's um, I guess you would call them traditional, but not orthodox. Like he says, for instance, uh, his they kept a kosher home, and he says that on the high holy days our store was closed. So on Shabbos, it's open, but it's closed on the high holidays. But uh, there was, uh, on Pesach, they didn't have any leavened food. He says, I can't claim that our home conformed in every way to the precepts of Orthodox Judaism, but it did so in large measure. So um, he's a he's like an old-fashioned uh, East European Jew uh, where uh, they're not Shomer Shabbos, and not exactly Orthodox, but not Reform. Not, uh, and they had a kosher home, which a Reform family wouldn't have. Uh, and he could have gone the reform route, but uh, he he didn't, and uh, he actually becomes completely what we would call orthodox. So I apologize for any descendants of Rabbi Drachman, perhaps, for implying that, uh, but it wouldn't have been a problem. I mean, it would have been even a, a, a more amazing story if he actually came from a, a complete reform background and uh, became who he became. So with this, we move on now to our next uh, unit. We've been doing this now uh, since the beginning of COVID. Uh, I think this will probably be three classes. Uh, I don't think more, but if it goes to four, it's okay. Uh, and uh, this is the Letters of the Rav that I found and published in the last issue of Hakira. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, introduction, how I came to these letters. Then we're going to go through them, and then we'll talk about what I think are significant in these letters. Um, for those who've been with us for so long, um, um, even just a couple of years, obviously the ones who've been here for many years, it wouldn't surprise you if I told you that for many years now I've been looking through archives. I've been finding things. Uh, I can say more than 35 years I've been uh, involved in archives, uh, archives of individuals, archives of institutions. I've traveled all over the world for that. Fortunately, I was able to get funding from various places. Uh, the, my book on Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg couldn't have been written if I was doing it today because half the letters are, are, go, are gone or lost. But I, um, I was able to go to people's children and people, and they let me into basements and look, and I found, Baruch Hashem, many things. And I published some of them. 
if you go on my academia page, you, academia page, you can find uh, some pieces from um, this new this journal that comes out of Flatbush called Hamashbir. It's an annual, actually. I published some. I, I published uh, pieces dealing with Frankfurt Orthodoxy, uh, with the rug from the Rugachover archive. Oh, lots of stuff. Uh, I think maybe um, my next Hebrew volume is I'll collect all or a, a lot of the letters. I have hundreds and hundreds of unpublished letters of Godolin, and I could put them in a nice volume. So that's uh, for the future. But for now. Um, let's talk about the Rav. So I never ended started looking for things from Rav Soloveitchik. But as I'm looking through archives, here and there, for the last 35 years, I would find a letter here, or find a letter there, and I uh, I just kept them, and I have a nice file. And uh, lo and behold, just last year, for some reason, it hit me, uh, why don't I publish these? Um, the reason I thought that is because... Uh, I um, had found, I also have some articles, believe it or not, from Rav Soloveitchik that he published that no one knows about. I mean, it's they're, they're published, <laughs> but they've been totally forgotten. And um, I will be uh, revealing them in, soon enough. But I, and one of these things I found, uh, Tradition, a few issues ago, uh, published, uh, I, I had a transcript of sorts of a talk the Rav gave at one of the Mizrahi conventions. And well, and I was preparing it actually for publication. Uh, it, it was in Hebrew. Someone tra transcribed it in Hebrew, although he, he gave the talk in Yiddish. Uh, lo and behold, tradition actually got a copy of the Rav's actual uh, manuscript from the house and they published it. And it's the same thing I had, but in more detail. So then I started thinking that uh, Maybe someone's going to find some of these letters because uh, it's not like I found. I found that most of them come from uh, public archives. You just have to know to look. But uh, you never know. And these days, people are putting everything online. So if I don't get it up soon, maybe it's going to be online, and then it's uh, it's no big deal anymore. Everyone can find it. Uh, so um, I, I took a few months. I transcribed them. Their um, the English handwriting is is fine. It's not a problem. Uh, there was I think two words in the entire. Uh, um collection I had a trouble with and I asked uh, one Rabbi Helfgott to help me and the other Rabbi Rakefet. The Hebrew handwriting uh is uh, quite difficult. But I, I put it together, uh this uh, nice uh, selection of what I think it's 21 or so uh, uh letters that we'll deal with and uh, one letter which was not included. I'll explain to you why they didn't include that as well. And I sent it to the Chakira. Chakira is the journal that comes, at, which has become very, uh, really a great journal. I think it originally was designed for more yeshivish people, but it's really more the modern Orthodox, because I guess the yeshivish people don't, uh, mo for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, are not interested in the things that uh, the journal wants. Um, and I sent it to them. And even though I had another piece on deck, I said, put this first and uh, you can postpone my other piece. Uh, but no, they're actually in the next issue. I think my other piece is coming out too. So I published it and it appeared, um, you can see it, uh, it's on, I think it's online already now. Uh, if not, it's on my academia site and it's uh, Letters from the Rav. Now, in dealing with the Rav, Rav Soloveitchik, there's a few different types of, um, uh, I'm not going to say information, but output of the Rav that we have to keep in mind. First of all, there's material that he himself published <clears throat> and prepared for publication, or at least prepared for publication. Uh, there's essays that he wrote, and then uh, volumes of uh, halachic articles, which were included in volumes. The Shirim was Echer Abamari, uh, which um, he was able to supervise, and um, Only Man of Faith, uh, Halachic Mind. Uh, which he prepared, although it appeared after his uh, death. Even the halachic man, the translation was prepared um, uh, under his uh, supervision. And those are obviously the most significant, the most, uh, if you're trying to judge Rav Soloveitchik, what his outlook is, his view on certain matters, that's the most important. And then we have public lectures and essays uh, prepared for publication by other people. But uh, these are public lectures, and maybe we have a transcript of that, or the Rav's notes, uh, or even the Rav's uh, actual text, because he would write out things. He'd write it out, often the speech he ad -libbed. So if you look, I'm going to give you an example in a few minutes of something where we have a tape of the Rav, and it's not identical 
to uh, what uh, he has written down. But basically, it's so we it's the same idea. And if we don't have tapes of it, we have that. And that was prepared. If the Rav was preparing it for publication, uh, he would have expanded in certain areas. But we don't have the Rav, so uh, we have that. Um, then we have, um, I would say, uh, letters. Um, a lot of letters. Now, how are you going to judge the significance? We're going to see examples where there's contradictions. When you deal with someone like the Rav, who was teaching every day and speaking to people and sending letters, and you're trying to set up a, uh, um, let's say, uh, a portrait of him and what he believed, sometimes you're going to have contradictions. So you're going to have to judge uh, the relative significance uh, of the material. Obviously, what he himself wrote and published, that's the most important. Letters are not as important as that. And if someone writes, says something in a private letter, but says something publicly, I think uh, we, we will assume that, at least in his public persona, that's his position. But the private letters are important because they show you the thinking behind the um, behind the stage, as it were. And um, if you have an, a, a real contradiction between the private letter and the public statement, it could be that the private letter is actually more important. The public statement could be made for political reasons. The private letter could reflect uh, personal sentiments that for one reason or another can't be made public. We'll, we'll see some examples of it. It's hard to know. The least, I think everyone would agree though. So we'll have a debate over the significance of private letters versus public statements. This goes back to the issue of Rebbe of Weinberg also, uh, what do you do when you have contradictions between the private letters I discovered and the public statements? But I think everyone would agree that what we call table talk, off-the-cuff comments, even in sheer, when he goes off, uh, that that is not as significant. It has to be put aside when faced with, let's say, private letters. When Because when you write a letter, you think about it, and you put your mind into it to say it. The same thing with a public statement, obviously, when you publish something. But what do I mean by uh, the um, the letters, uh, the public table talk statements? I mean a book like this, The Rub Thinking Aloud, Transcripts of Personal Conversations with Joseph B. Salvagic. Fascinating. But... Uh, I, you know, the Rav was like everyone else. He could have an offhand comment. I don't think that uh, you need to pay it that much mind if it contradicts what we know about the, what the Rav said elsewhere. On the other hand, we have examples. For instance, his view of Yom Atzmaut, uh, you have here a 40, 50 page uh, transcript of a of a lengthy discussion to the Shear in which he even responds to criticism from the students, uh, that would obviously be more significant than uh, off-the-cuff uh, comments. I don't know if this book will be reprinted again. There was, a, although people like Rabbi Meiselman on the right wing were very happy with it, uh, the mainstream followers of Soloveitchik were very uh, upset with it. They didn't think this is the sort of thing that the Rav would want uh, made public, even though some of the things they're upset about, he said, with a huge tape recorder, not one of these little ones, one of these old-fashioned giant ones sitting right on his desk. He had to assume that that would be made public. But um, uh, they, they reprinted a second edition where they took out uh, a couple things. Uh, and I don't know if they'll reprint it again, uh, but uh, it was put out by uh, uh, David Holzer, or by David Holzer, who was a shamash, uh, very close to the Rav. The Rav was very close to the Holzer family. The father, Emmanuel Holzer, was one of the Rav's closest friends. Uh, so you can't, um, uh, and and I uh, I spent a whole Pesach with the Holzer's, Holzer's at the hotel I go to. You certainly can't accuse them of uh, trying to create some uh, Haredi image uh, of the Rav or anything like that. So uh, it's a complicated issue, uh, which... Uh, Maybe we'll go into another time. In terms of uh, the drushos of the Rav, I just want to share one thing with you before we begin. We have two volumes of Yiddish, thanks to David Fishman, Professor David Fishman of JTS, um, expert in East European Jewry and Yiddish. He put out this volume, Drushos und Ksavim, from, um, I forget the year already, 2017. And then... Um, in 2021, I think it is, or uh, or 2020, actually, hold on, it has an English title page, let me see. 2021, he put out this volume. Uh, Joshos Vegan Shiva Siyam and Kiyam Ha'uma. Joshos about uh, return to Zion and uh, the existence of our nation, all his religious Zionist talks. This, incidentally, this picture, which I published on the Sarin blog, I don't know if you could see it well here, you can see it on a Svarim blog. It's a picture in 
a painting of the Rav in Rabbi Julius Berman's house. It's hanging. It's a huge painting. I went to interview him once, and I see this painting, and I said, can I take a picture of this? <laughs> and then can I publish it? And he let me publish it. So if you want to see this amazing picture, um, um, now, I forget how he got it. Uh, someone wanted to, to do a painting of the Rav. I don't think it was Berman. And, and then uh, Berman asked, well, the Rav didn't know what to do with it. So I think I think that's the story. I um, I forget the details. If some of you know uh, Julius Berman, you could uh, fill us in. And so it's hanging there. Um, one of the drushos in this book, um, drushos from Kasavim, is the... Um, Oh, first, let me tell you, you learned something interesting from the introduction, that one of the drushos here, a drush on Sadaka, was given to the uh, the workman's circle, the arbiter ring. Uh, this is not exactly a religious group, but the Rav uh, gave that. Furthermore, he gave a drusha, one of the drushos we know he did, it's it's not here, but it's mentioned in the introduction that he gave a drusha was uh, before Yivo. And on page uh, 22 from the Farverts, uh, um, Fishman quotes, what they're saying here, how amazing it is that a grandson of Rav Chaim Brisker uh, is speaking to us. Uh, Rav Chaim Brisker, who was so uh, uh, opposed to the uh, uh, who we are, uh, you have a grandson of Rav Chaim Brisker. Uh, Rav Chaim Brisker's anical had those unsuzagin. He's he's speaking to us, so that's amazing. But what you have here is uh, the famous drasha of uh, the Rav at Chinuch Atzmai. And uh, we're going to speak about Chinuch Atzmai maybe today, because uh, there's one of the letters. And then I'll speak about uh, that there's a difference between the drosha here and what I'll show you that you can listen to uh, online. Now let's let me put this aside or, or hold it here. And let me, uh, let's begin. By the way, I also one final point that um, um, I was a little nervous uh, to publish this. Uh, it's not like Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg, no family. Uh, Descendants, uh, no descendants to uh, speak about, uh, but uh, Rav Soloveitchik has. Uh, so I, I sent all the letters to Professor Chaim Soloveitchik, and he gave me permission, happily, to publish uh, all this. I think it's the only time where, uh, and I'm very grateful to Professor Soloveitchik. Uh, we had a nice correspondence where he reflected a little bit on uh, some of what's there. So uh these letters are authorized, if that uh, means anything. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, so let me begin. Uh, and what I'm going to do is is just uh, go through the letters, uh, each letter, tell you about the background, what I find significant in the letters. And letters one through three are written to Rabbi Mordechai Kirschbaum. Rabbi Mordechai Kirsch, Kirschbaum was a religious Zionist leader in America. In 1952, he's head of Mizrahi. He's elected head of Mizrahi of America. So obviously, he's very close to Rav Soloveitchik. Uh, for those who don't know, well, Rav Soloveitchik was a member of the Buddhist Israel. Not in Europe, but when he comes to America. He was even on the Melitzis Gadolia Torah in the late 30s. Uh, for those who don't believe it, I'll show you. It's in Hapardes. It actually gives the members of the uh, um, Aguda Sisrael Moetis Gedolia Torah. And although he's young, 35 years old, let's say, 36, uh, he was uh, uh, placed on it. But uh, then um, after the Holocaust, uh, probably during the Holocaust, his uh, ideas begin to change. After the Holocaust, he identifies uh, uh, with Mizrahi. And uh, he was the star speaker. I have some good pictures, which I found also, of the Rav speaking at the Mizrahi uh, conventions. He was their star speaker. And uh, so obviously in very close uh, contact with Mordechai Kirschblum. Uh, Kirschblum was also uh, appointed to the Jewish Agency Executive. And in 1968, he moves uh, to Israel, uh, where he continues his religious Zionist uh, activities. Uh, now, the first letter is from 1956, and uh, it already is going to complicate uh, our portrait. Uh, the thing about the Rav is that he's a Zionist, but I hope I don't offend anyone by saying he's the most non-Zionist Zionist uh, you can find. That is, whoever heard of a Zionist who never went to the state of Israel? I mean, it's... Uh, and... Um, Whoever heard of a Zionist that everyone who told him that I want to go on Aliyah, he said, don't, we stay here. So like in theory, he's a great, uh, he's a great Zionist and his writings are the most stirring uh, calls uh, to see to Zionism. 
And today, they're standard texts in religious Zionist schools in Israel. But for a long time, in the 60s and 70s, the attitude was he's not a real Zionist because uh, he's not coming to live. He's not coming to live in Israel. And uh, it's true. The Rav is not a Zionist the way we're all so we're often indoctrinated. Uh, the, the, well, what defines a religious Zionist show? The prayer for the state of Israel. Well, the Rav didn't believe in that. And uh, certainly with uh, Rav Cook and the move to Messianic Zionism uh, is very far from uh, the Rav. So a lot of the ideas that uh, we take for, we assume are essential for religious Zionism, uh, the Rav didn't share it. And you can see um, in... Uh, Thinking aloud, uh, when the students of uh, Yeshiva University on, uh, did a special like uh, Haftorah or Halal service, I forget all the details, and Yomot Smut, the Rav goes crazy, and he can't handle it, and he's saying this is nonsense, and nonsense, this is what uh, the chief rabbinic says to do, this is what uh, religious Zionists could always throw have said to do, a special prayer service, so the Rav is a different type of Zionist, uh, um, and now and we, we, we see, and I'll, could he have been, I mean, we, we, he had some hesitations. How could he not? His grandfather was Rav Chaim Brisker. If in the early 20th century, the two leading anti-Zionists were, one was the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Rashab, and the other was Rav Chaim Brisker. The stuff Rav Chaim Brisker, Rav Chaim Brisker said, you can't even be alone with the Zionists because we have to worry about Sheikh uh, Hostamim, that they could kill you. And I uh, I don't know whether he meant it literally or not, but the fact that he said it, Rav Chaim Brisker was as anti-Zionist as you can get, and not, not for theological reasons, like um, the, the Satmar, the, the three Shavuos, no, because the Zionists are interested in uprooting traditional Judaism, all the, we, all, we know all the reasons. So for the Rav, for someone from, and, and his uncle, his uncle was like Naturi Karto, for someone, the Rav, with that Yichos, to become a Tzioni, uh, to become a Zionist, that needs an explanation. That's uh, why his, um, that's how he can, hold, it's not that he, he's not going to say, I changed my mind. How, who's he compared to his grandfather? If you know how he viewed his grandfather, his, his grandfather, he viewed him as the, the, the greatest uh, Torah scholar. He had a Havana, he said, greater than the Vilna Gon. So he could not say that I think my grandfather is wrong. What he said is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's the Joseph and his brothers. God himself decided for us. If it was just um, the Rabbanim, of course we have to follow Zaidi. Uh, but no, HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself, Paskins in this area, that Mizrahi is correct. So if the Rav didn't have moments, and I think what you see in the Rav thinking loud is these moments before he gets dressed and puts on his tie and goes out and presents himself the way he is, a religious Zionist, you can be sure that at nighttime, when he's thinking, he has hesitations. He wonders, is this the proper path? And uh, and I think that's why these comments, these harsh comments that you see when he really uh, lets his hair down and uh, lets loose to the students, these these non-Zionists, I won't say anti-Zionists, but he's definitely not, he, he sounds like he's Ravaran Cutler coming out of Lakewood, some of these comments. Uh, I think that's what you're seeing a reflection of, not the thought out positions of the Rav, but um, something that's deep down that he sublimates. And we see a little of this here. What's the poor, what's this first letter? Well, uh, he mentions his daughter, Tova, 1956. I don't know Tova, but anyone you could show her the letter, you can ask her. I'm sure she remembers. He says, I very much, I appreciate greatly your efforts on behalf of Tova and her friends. I was very disturbed and indignant when I received a phone call from Tova advising me that the LL people were trying to persuade her and other passengers to board the plane in London on Friday. So um, Tova and other American Orthodox uh, youth, uh, um, I guess, um, in those, I don't know if she's a teenager then. I don't know when she's born, 56. Um, if that's, um, yeah, I think, um, so I don't know, but uh, uh, either a teenager or 20, whatever, when she's born. Uh, so they flew to London, and obviously there's a delay, and there's a problem here because uh, the next leg of the flight uh, is to Israel, and El was telling them that they should get the kids, the religious kids, get on the flight, and you'll make it for Shabbos. And Tova calls her father, and um, you know, here you have uh, El Ala's official Israeli government at the time, it's not private, uh, telling people something which, of course, is going to lead to, to Chilol Shabbos. Uh, and this annoys the Rav to no end. Uh, quote, I resented the deliberate attempt on the part of El officials 
to mislead a group of sincere boys and girls and to place them in a precarious position in which they would have been compelled to violate the Shabbos. So we see from this that they didn't violate it. Obviously, they didn't. Uh, maybe the, the Rav probably said, uh, don't listen to them. And uh, you, someone can ask Tova, what happened? Maybe they flew uh, Sunday, whatever it is. Uh, and the Rav says the LL officials knew very well that it was impossible for a plane which is supposed to take off from the London airfield on Friday noontime to land in Lida, Israel, before sunset. You know, Lida, that's before Ben Gurion Airport. It's Lud Airport. Uh, nevertheless, they kept on asserting that such a miracle of Kafitza Saderach was possible and quite probable. And they repeatedly assured, he said, the people that uh, this they, it would land in, uh, in time. By the way, these this letter, uh, um, you know, I didn't. Th this letter I found in the Central Zionist Archives in Israel. So I went to the Central Zionist Archives. I sat there for a long, long time. They're not online yet, uh, and I found it. So, um, and then he says, "What is it in this paragraph? Such false predictions." reflect a cynical and brutal disregard for religious values, which is so characteristic of the official dumb in Israel. We, it's hard for us to imagine today when you walk through Jerusalem. I was in Jerusalem a few weeks ago. I mean, you walk in Jerusalem, it's like, it's uh, it's not true. It's I don't know if it's half is, uh, but uh, there's certainly many people in Jerusalem who are not Shomer Shabbos. And they created now the... Um, you know, the first station, and you see Friday night, but sometimes when you're walking in Jerusalem, you get the sense that everyone, everyone is religious there, and it's a very, but in the 50s, yarmulkes would be, not just in the minority, it would be hard to find yarmulkes. I already mentioned that religious people working for the government felt they had to remove their yarmulkes. To have religious people in the army, look who now is uh, just appointed chief of staff, a nephew of Rav Kook. Uh, Great nephew of Rav Cook and uh, religious people were in all high positions in police, in army. I mean, this would have been unimaginable in the 50s. And we know, we all know what the, the officials of the labor government, what they were doing for the people who went on Aliyah, what they were doing with the Yemenites and the Svardim. And so obviously things have changed a great deal. We have to put ourselves back into the 1950s. And, but, and now just after blasting, What's going on in the state of Israel in, in, with uh, the official dumb and with El Al, the Rav says as follows to Kirschbaum. Now, remember, the Rav is head of Mizrahi here. Um, he, this did not stop him, as we'll see, from publicly clashing with Israel. We'll see later about the shipping line and other things. The Rav could uh, clash publicly with Israel. But some of the things... Uh, I don't know if he'd say publicly. He says to Kirschbaum that you know my emotional and intellectual involvement in the sacred cause of Shivat Zion. That's what makes the Rav Zionist. The idea that we return to Zion, we're called to return. And he says, my relationship to the state of Israel, he sees it as a miraculous grant of infinite divine grace to a martyred, abused, and persecuted people. He's saying to him, you know that I think the state of Israel is the greatest gift that God has given us. Elsewhere, the Rav says that if not for the state of Israel, the Jewish people, it just would have led to complete assimilation, because after the destruction of the Holocaust, there was nothing there for us. We needed this. Uh, we needed God to give us. And he says that you're also aware that whenever zealots and bigots tried to create imaginary religious issues, and he says, and I felt that they were doing this because of hatred for the state of Israel, I stood up and protested. He's referring here to Satmar and uh, people in the yeshiva world today, what we call the Haredi world, but Satmar in particular, Satmar would have protests. They were protests over mix, over the swimming pool in Jerusalem, over girls, uh, you know, are they going to draft girls to the army or, uh, or not? And Satmar and the non-Jews have blood on their hands. <laughs> this is 10 years after the Holocaust, and Satmar is having these uh, giant rallies uh, and um, the Rav refers to them as zealots and bigots, and uh, it's unfair the way they're describing uh, what's going on in Israel. And the Rav says, I stand up for it. But then the Rav says, because of this, because I have been so out there defending the state of Israel against the people who unfairly criticize it, he says, that's why when I feel I encounter irresponsible conduct and willful interference by irreligious officials that affect the religious conscience, he says, doubts of a very unpleasant nature begin to assail my head. He says, and, and willy-nilly, I question myself whether I am always right 
in refusing to give credence to the slanderous rumors circulated by the extremists. So he says here, first of all, this word willy-nilly. The Rav uh, came to this word, and he loved this word. He would repeat this word a lot. But he says that, uh, he says, even me, such a great defender of the state of Israel, when I encounter what I just encountered, I begin to wonder, doubts, he says, so assail my head. Uh, am I always right when I come out against Satmar and come out against the right-wing yeshiva circles when they're attacking the state of Israel for this and that? And maybe they're right. Maybe I shouldn't be defending the state of Israel just uh, uh, intuitively and saying, oh, it has to be wrong. Because now I see, with my own eyes, we see that an arm of the Israeli government, if they had its ways, would have put these kids on the plane and force them to be Mechal Shabbos. And then they're going to show up at 8 o'clock, it's already Shabbos. Then what are they going to do? They're going to put them on buses. And, you know, you see what's going to happen here. He says, um, cannot the Jewish agency understand once and for all that the thousands of young boys and girls born and reared in the U.S., religion means a great deal more than mere ceremony? These officials in Israel, they think that, uh, you know, uh, religion is going to be gone soon, and it's something for the old people. And if we see the young people with it, we have to try to uproot this, these, these phony superstitions. He says that the, uh, these people, these secularists in Israel, don't realize that we have committed young Orthodox Jews in America who are, quote, ready to forgo many activities for the sake of complying with the law, the Torah. He says they've observed Shabbos when they were in school sometimes a great sacrifice, and they are not going to forsake the sacred principle because of a trip to Israel. Not even Ben-Gurion, with his illiterate philosophy of Judaism, will succeed in changing their mode of living. So, I mean, it's uh, these are strong words, with, and even stronger from the head of the, uh, the honorary head of uh, Mizrahi in America, saying that we can't take this anymore, and we can't cover this up, that uh, we can't make believe that these officials are not trying to uproot Torah in our young people. It's bad enough in the old people, but in the young people, that's where the battle always is. It's the young people and uh, the, um, the, 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 uh, the leaders. The Zionist leaders understood that if you capture the young, uh, you'll capture the future. I mean, the idea that uh, today we'd have such a, a religion in the state of Israel, this, this would have been incomprehensible to them in the 50s. Uh, and then he continues, he, he congratulates him from uh, his new post at the Department of Religious Culture of the Jewish Agency. There used to be, I don't know if it it's still exists. A Department of Religious Culture. And they, they published important volumes. Uh, it's the Aron's, uh, it's really the first book on the philosophy of Rav Kook uh, was published in English by the this uh, Department of Religious Culture. BMT, my alma mater, based on the Torah. As Rav Kefet never tires of saying, the first institution, Torah institution in the state of Israel directed toward the Anglo-Saxon world. That was funded by the uh, Department of Religious Culture of the Jewish Agency. Now, that's, that's the letter, uh, the first letter. And in the note... I'll I'll bring it to you next week because um, Rabbi Beryl Wine, I, I don't remember 100% the details. I want to have it in front of me. Beryl Wine wrote a memoir called Teach Them Diligently, and um, I didn't get a chance to get it, but I'll get it for next uh, class. He also gives an example where El Al did not follow Halakha and the Rub's response. That was always issues like in the 70s, as I recall, you know, flying on Shabbos, not flying on Shabbos, but that's a different issue. Here, the Rub's speaking about what he sees as an attempt of, um, of uh, irreligious coercion. They speak a lot about religious coercion, but there's also uh, irreligious coercion. Uh, Ratziu Huda Cook was a, you can't get more Zionist than Ratziu Huda Cook. He was a member of the Society Against Religious Coercion in Israel because um, he believed that the only way to bring the um, the religious, the non religious coasts uh, was uh, not by coercing them. Uh, when I say coercion, though, he, he didn't mean that uh, he had a different understanding of coercion because he didn't say, therefore, you shouldn't have the Rabbanut controlling marriage and divorce. They didn't believe in uh, allowing buses to run on Shabbos, but uh, he had his own, uh, he had a much more limited coercion. But uh, as uh, Ratzi Yehuda and many others never tired of pointing out, uh, uh, 
if we say that we're against religious coercion, then you should be against irreligious coercion. There always was a lot of irreligious coercion uh, in Israel also, and it pains me to say it, but uh, if you know the history, you know that when uh, the Aliyat Noar, when they brought over, especially the kids from Morocco and uh, the people from Yemen, there was an effort there to indoctrinate them into um, irreligiosity, and that's just a fact, and uh, and that was battled uh, the, the religious parties battled about this, and governments fell, you know, on this. But this goes back already to the '40s, and the, the Tehran, when uh, the, the kids, kids, the who were survivors of the Holocaust, who made their way to Tehran, and then they were brought to uh, Palestine. The deal that was made between the chief rabbinate and the religious parties and the Jewish agency was that kids from religious families would be placed with religious homes. And kids from uh, irreligious families in Europe would go to irreligious homes. And lo and behold, they discovered that kids who in Europe uh, and who are now were rescued, who came from religious families, were being placed in irreligious kibbutzim. And uh, that's, uh, that was uh, a big controversy. Uh, so that's, that's letter uh, uh, number one. Um, We'll go another uh, 10 minutes or so to take the questions. The second letter, I put all the letters to Rabbi Kirschboom together. And in fact, these two letters, the first one is July 12th, 1956. And the second is July 13th, the very next day. And he says, after I wrote you the letter, I forgot to mention this. He also has the Hebrew uh, uh, date on top of the um, of, of both of the letters. But notice the Rav has no problem uh, putting in the English date. There are some people who won't write the, uh, the uh, secular date, or if they do, they'll say July 13th. They won't say 1956. They'll have a little apostrophe. They'll say 56 or something like that. Uh, and there are sources that speak about this, halachic sources, but the uh, the, the accepted uh, approach is that there's no um, there's no there's no problem here. It, 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 contrary to what people think, and some of the people who oppose it say, "Well, this this dates from uh, Jesus's birth." Well, it really doesn't. Jesus, we know, was born maybe four BCE. So yeah, they I, I, they they gave that as the date, but we know he wasn't, and it's uh, it really has 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 no significance uh, in people's mind in that respect. So. Uh, uh, and you see Misa Rav, the Rav uh, putting the date. Now, the second letter is, um, he says, I wrote to you last night, but I forgot to mention that I was very annoyed by the telegrams from the chief rabbinate. It's, the Rav had a love-hate relationship with the chief rabbinate uh, of Israel. Um, on the one hand, he himself was asked to be chief rabbi. Um, and uh, he turned it down because he explained that uh, the, the position is one of where you're uh, subject to all sorts of pressures by the government. And uh, in 1935, he wanted to be chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. After that, he, uh, after Herzog passed away, uh, they wanted him very much uh, to be chief rabbi. Um, he would have, they would have given it to him. Well, we're going to get to him. I'll show you the telegram uh, later on. But the Rav, uh, turned it down. On the other hand, the Rav always gave great respect to the holders of uh, Chief Rabbinate, and he understood correctly that uh, because the idea that you'd have separation of church and state was separation of synagogue and state was not something the Rav held, that you need a strong Chief Rabbinate, because uh, as long as there is no separation of synagogue and state, you need to have Talmidi Chachamim in charge of uh, the Chief Rabbinate, of the Batei Din. Uh, and remember, in Rav Soloveitchik's time, it's not like today. Today, there doesn't seem to be any assumption that the, the chief rabbis have to be G'dol Yisrael. And uh, we've seen that they've elected people who are not G'dol Yisrael. They could be fine rabbis, but not G'dol Yisrael of the sort that we speak of. Uh, and But in the, the days, in the, at least until uh, relatively recently, it was thought that uh, the chief rabbi would be, if not the greatest, one of the greatest Gedolim in the religious Zionist world. And you had that. You had Rav Kook, you had Rav Herzog, you had Rav Unterman, Rav Goran, even Rav Avram Shapiro. These were Gedoli, Gedoli Yisrael. Uh, but the chief rabbinate, precisely because of what Rav, the Rav says, that it's it's forced to uh, succumb to certain pressures, or felt it's forced to succumb from the government, that's why that, that annoyed him so to no end. He says in this letter, I don't know what the issue is, but he says, I resent the delaying tactics and maneuvers practiced by the members of this great and venerable institution. There was some halachic issue. Um, he says, it took my brother, that's Ravaro, 
exactly several hours to arrive at definite conclusions and offer voluntarily advice and guidance to young people who are perplexed, perplexed and confused. Now, I don't think it's referring to the issue, maybe it is, that they were stuck in London because uh, the Tova calls the Rav. The Rav would tell her what to do. What to, then gonna, he's going to say, call my brother. He'll, he'll tell you what to do. And you're going to have telegrams with the chief rabbinic. I, I, it doesn't make sense. I, I think this is some other issue that there was a, an issue where they want, needed guidance. Maybe it was religious Zionist kids going to Israel. They needed guidance from the chief rabbinic. Uh, maybe it's Yom Tov Shani. Maybe it's that they're being put at certain kibbutzim that have kosher issues. Whatever it is, he says the chief rabbinic is hemming and hawing and not doing anything. They're afraid to make a decision. And he says, my brother, he, he gave them guidance, and in a few hours of hearing all the issues here and in investigation, he was able to give them clear-cut guidance. Uh, he says, why should the rabbinate, whose duty it is to render clear-cut decisions, debate the issue for weeks and months and attempt to evade responsibility? Oh, so we see from here it's not the issue of, uh, go, of, uh, of Tova's issue, because he's talking about something that's been going on for months that uh, you can't get uh, you can't get a word from the chief rabbinate. They say, well, we have to think about it. We'll get back to you, that sort of thing. And he says that, listen to this. Uh, in the future, I am not going to cooperate with the chief rabbinate since it, it is beset by fears and ludicrous cowardice. And from time to time, he says, it engages in hypocrisy. He says that I too can wrap myself in the mantle of a saint, in quotes, and a kanai, a zealot, and let myself be proclaimed a tzaddik. In other words, he's saying that the members of the chief rabbinate, they're afraid that they're going to be attacked. If they give a halakhic decision, someone's going to attack them, and they're worried, they're looking over the shoulders, and the Rav says that uh, I too can claim to be a, a saint and a kanai and not give a decision, and no one's going to attack me then, but that's not their responsibility. Their responsibility, they were given this position, and they have to make the decision. And if making the decision means that people on the right are going to attack them, well, then uh, that's their responsibility. Um, and he goes on uh, criticizing the uh, the chief rabbinate. Uh, the um, um, harsh criticism, which he would not have made public. He would not have uh, ever spoken about this at a Mizrahi convention because it's very, very harsh criticism. And uh, look, let's be honest, uh, the chief rabbinate, uh, even when, and we're talking about an era of Herzog and Ernissin, really good old Yisrael there, but uh, th there were problems. Uh, there's always going to be problems when you have a, a rabbinate that's being pressured a great deal. And uh, Rav Herzog, who was a, a gadol of enormous, massive proportions, uh, we know that he was afraid to come out with decisions. He was very afraid of uh, the response of the Haredim. And uh, he was very nervous about that. He valued his connections in the Haredi world. And uh, he punted on many occasions and uh, didn't really take a stand on issues, which if you don't take a stand, you're taking a stand because uh, things are going to develop a certain way. Now, the, the, the last part of the letter, um, the last paragraph, is, is interesting in a different respect. Uh, remember, I told you Kirschbaum was appointed head of this Department of Religious Culture. And he says to him that, you know, I, I hope you can put it on a solid educational basis. And the Rav tells him you should offer courses. And what type of courses? He says you should integrate. It's amazing to think about it today because this never would have happened. Integrate the Department of Religious Culture into a program of an existing graduate school and conducted in the same manner, for example, that Harvard with regard to its Russian or Middle Eastern Institute. So he's saying that the uh, Department of Religious Culture should maybe be set up in Colombia. Colombia should have an institute for the study of religious Zionism or something. He, the Rav is trying to create like a real intellectual institute where the issues are studied on the highest level. That never would have happened. And it wasn't even, it wasn't even, as we say, a hava, I mean, a thought to the people running it. But it's, look what the Rav is thinking about. He's thinking really, really high. And then he says, I believe that the yeshiva, yeshiva university will be glad to cooperate with you. Uh, and he says, he says, don't just have lectures from time to time. Uh, you can do that. But uh, he, he says you should have an institute, publish a periodical dealing with religious, philosophical, or popular topics, uh, which have a bearing on our statehood problematics. This would enhance the prestige of our movement. And he goes on. But, uh, and he says that uh, it would disseminate 
knowledge among the culture and laity, uh, and I'm willing to cooperate with you. Provided, he says, the work will be organized along these lines. The Rav says, I'll cooperate, but you have to organize it on a high level, something that I feel is going to make a real contribution. And they never did. And I think it would have been impossible to, because that's not what it was about. It was more about uh, educating um, younger people. And uh, although they did publish, as I said, some works, they did publish some booklets and pamphlets, but uh, never an institute in a high level. Like basically, he's asking for like an orthodox forum sort of um, institution. So with this, I see it's already 925. So we see the two letters. Oh, he signs, by the way, his name. Sincerely yours, J. Soloveitchik. Uh, in the first letter, it's Joseph Soloveitchik. Uh, when we get to the uh, the Hebrew names, it's uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, you'll you'll see some things. We're actually going to skip letter three, and we'll pick up next week with letter four. Chinuch How is it that a Mizrahiite becomes the big fundraiser for the Aguda Chinuch and gives one of his greatest speeches? That, uh, uh, but we'll get to that. Uh, I can play you some of it uh, as well. Let me take uh, some of the comments here. Uh, thank you all for those who are new. Thank you for joining us. Uh, <laughs> now I know what Yosef felt when Sarah Mashkin forgot him. Yes. Uh, and I hope uh, Rabbi Yellen, I don't know if you heard a chance, had a chance to hear last class where I, I dealt with uh, that issue we've been discussing through emails. Um, Bina says, you say everyone trusted them. Please define everyone. Would Ramosha have gone to the pioneer? All I can say is listen to the class last week. Not only would Ramosha have gone to the pioneer, Ramosha's granddaughter's wedding was at the pioneer. And Ramosha always went there for sukkahs. Uh, and uh, as we heard last class, the, and the Aguda convention was there. The Aguda Sisro would have their conventions there. And uh, so everyone went there. And Rabbi Yellen said that's where they used to do the Shaduchim. So, yes, I know it's hard for people today to grasp this, but uh, I can tell you that um, Simcha by the Sea, as I've said, but we have new people. I did the Sheva Brachos of Ruvain Feinstein's daughter. I was the waiter. Ravaron Cutler's wife came every single Shabbos, and Rebetzin Schwartzman, Ravaron's daughter. And so once I was there, one Shabbos, Ravdov Schwartzman. And Rebitz and Schwartzman were there the same weekend. You know, they're divorced, uh, but they were there the same weekend. So I talked and learning that whole Shabbos with Rodolf Schwartzman. Uh, uh, no hashkacha on the place, never. Uh, but that was uh, the olden days. Uh, Thank okay, you. I love it. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, oh, and Ravi Allen says, yes, Ramosha did, certainly. Yeah. Uh, uh, doesn't New York State have a kosher law? It had a kosher law, and it has a kosher law. But that doesn't mean any mashkiach. Uh, they have their own mashkiach. The mashkiach is, uh, I have a relative, my wife's relative, and we went to a shiva house. And they're not religious, so, but they had uh, stuff there, so I didn't know if it's kosher. So they said, we got it from so-and-so. Uh, I don't know Long Island. So I uh, I asked him, I said, uh, is there a mashkiach? He says, Yes, New, New York Department of Agriculture. <laughs> that's that's gone. That, that he says it's kosher because uh, once in a blue moon, the Department of Agriculture. So there is, uh, but uh, we know that uh, if you really take kosher seriously, you can't trust that. And that and that actually was found unconstitutional in New Jersey. They got rid of the uh, the. I think in New York also they might have gotten rid of it. I think there was there was that place in Connacht, New York, I think, where they had uh, conservative ashkacha and the Orthodox rabbi didn't. Uh, the Orthodox people running the, uh, the Department of Agriculture in, uh, section kept giving them fines. So I know it went to court, but uh, that's not, um, uh, yes, New York State will say, uh, but uh, that doesn't need, mean you need to have mashkiach there of the sort that we have. Uh, Rabbi Shapiro? Yeah, hold, hold on a second. Let me, yes, yes, go on. Sorry. Yes. Uh, in 19, to go back to the Rav. Uh, in 1954, it was the first Mahon Kayats, um, which I had the pleasure of going in. And uh, when I came back on um, Rosh Hashanah, um, I was a member of the Belgian community. Uh, that was the Maria Shul, uh, where the Rav was the rabbi at the time. And he, after davening, he, his famous finger went like this to me. And he told me to come up to his apartment after in the afternoon. He wanted to fahare me about Israel. And uh, outside the door before I went in, Tova was sitting there and said, Nikki, make it good. I want to go. So I said, <laughs> okay. And uh, 
he was extraordinarily interested. He wanted to know exactly what I saw, what I thought, how I felt about it. And uh, you should know during the, um, our families were quite close. And at the time when he was uh, supposed to be the chief rabbi, everybody in uh, our community begged him not to do it because he would get, we felt he would get slaughtered and uh, it was beneath his dignity. One of the reasons he never went was he felt that if he went, he could never leave. And so he wanted to know for sure that he was going to go before he would, um, you know, take that kind of, that kind yeah. of a trip. Thank you very much. For those who don't know, the Maria Shul is where the Rav would also give shear during the week, and uh, he would give, uh, uh, he would come on different Shabbat scene. But some people have speculated that it's precisely because of his experience in 1935 that uh, that he was then reluctant to uh, throw his hat in the ring. And uh, um, in terms of visiting, uh, off, it's also said that if he went there, he would have had to go to Heichel Shlomo. He'd have to give a kavo to the chief rabbis. After all, he's coming as the head of the Mizrahi. And the problem was that his uncle, Ravelvo, they put a cheyrim on Heichel Shlomo. You can't step foot in there. So how can, and he's very close to his uncle from his youth. How can he then, he couldn't go to Heichel, he couldn't go to Israel without going to the chief rabbis Heichel Shlomo, but he couldn't go to Heichel Shlomo because his uncle put it in a cheyrim. So uh, it seems, but many times he said he's going. We'll get to this next class or the class after. He said, I'm coming, I'm coming this summer, I'm coming next summer. He was going to go with his wife. Um, they built, um, when, when Gruss, the whole idea of Gruss was that uh, Gruss gave the money for the Gruss Institute, which is then where BMT was and now Torah Shraga. The, the, the agreement was, Gruss gave the money on the Tanai, on the assumption, on the, they made an actual agreement that the Rav would come there for six months to give Shear one semester. So uh, we'll get back to all these things. Um, someone says, uh, Ben, that the COR, oh. I guess that's in Canada, they, they made every food store downtown take down any signs written in Hebrew. Um, so people would be, uh, yeah, I, they, people would uh, be confused, I guess, if they saw it. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, want to say one, one more thing? One yeah. Of, yeah. One other thing is his wife at that point in the 50s was quite sick. There were times when he, she was in the hospital and back. I think that figured very strongly into his, uh, I mean, he I remember my brother blowing show for, for her because she couldn't even make it to school. In the he says that. Time. On the other hand, he doesn't even go after a passing. He doesn't go when he keeps saying he's going to go when he doesn't go. And there seems to be there was some fear or some something keeping him from going. Look, Belkin never went either, yeah. uh, which is a strange because why you opened up a place there. Um, it's hard to imagine. Uh, Ramosha did go, but Ramosha only went, uh, he went, I think, for the Aguda convention. He did not go after 67 when there was a Kotel there. And uh, so it's it's hard for us to imagine uh, uh, why, it's a, it's a great mystery, uh, why the Rav never was able to, to bring himself to go. Uh, and we'll get back to that because I think uh, I'll speak uh, more about that. Um, Jacob says that Thinking Aloud is available for sale. You can get a copy at the Wall Use Furniture Sale, but you need to check. I think it's the second edition, the edition where they censored some material in it. Uh, but yeah, it's for sale. You can go, they, the holders have a website where you can get not just Thinking Aloud. They did, uh, I think it's three or four volumes on Chumash they put out, a very nice uh, material there. And also one of the sons of... Uh, uh, Rabbi David Holzer is an expert in publishing Rishonim. And also David Holzer and one of his sons published this beautiful Haggadah with pictures, medieval uh, manuscript with pictures. Uh, so there's a lot of good stuff. I think it's uh, holzersforum.com or something like that. David Holzer also, he's he's a chemist with uh, patents. I mean, a brilliant family. Uh, David Eisen says, I assume the painting in Julius Berman's home was prepared from a photo as opposed to the Rav posing for the painting. You know, I'm going to get to the answer to this because I think I think otherwise. I think the Rav posed. I think his wife wanted him to, to do it. Uh, uh, but I will ask because I had I can't believe why I, 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 I don't remember. But I, I'll get the answer uh, for next class uh, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll share it. Uh, preserve it for posterity. Gershon says, Rabbi Kirschbaum frequently visited my home in Golders Green and used to write extremely mellifluous letters uh, 
to my mother, thank you for hospitality, a very friendly man. Um, and David says, Rabbi Rekhefer claims that the Rav indeed planned to make Aliyah, and these were rescinded when his wife passed away, as he was unable to come in Aliyah as a widower. Yeah. Um, um, look, obviously, if you speak to uh, Tova, you'll, she'll tell you probably about conversations they had with her. All I know is that we have many examples where the Rav said, I plan on coming. In print, he says, and we have letters where he says, I plan on coming, let's say, this summer, and it didn't happen, and... Uh, Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg also. Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg, they sent him, they sent him airline tickets in the 50s. Everything was paid for. All he has to do is get to Zurich and get on the plane. And he says he's going. And he said it, he kept saying, I'm coming, I'm coming. And then he didn't go. And then they did it again and again. And then they stopped taking him seriously. He said, how could Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg also a big Zionist? And yet he couldn't bring himself uh, to, uh, he was more of a Zionist than the Rav in certain respects, because he spoke of it as like an assault to the Geula, and it, it's it's a mystery. Uh, David says, did the Rav have any uh, correspond, interaction, correspondence or interaction with Vyol Teitelbaum? I have never heard of any interaction. Uh, Rav Moshe did. And we have a, a Talmud looking at, right at me of uh, Rav Tuvia Goldstein. And if you read the, the, the biography of Rav Tuvia Goldstein, where you'll see this Talmud's picture in it, uh, uh, they talk about Rav Tuvia Goldstein was the shliach, or the go-between between, between uh, Rav Moshe and the Satmar Rebbe, uh, because, you know, the Satmar basically, they only want to put him in Cherem after the AI, uh, artificial insemination decision, and they were going crazy. But uh, so they tried to have some shalom by meeting, but Ram and Ramosha was supposed to meet with the Satmar Rebbe, but in the end, it didn't happen. I've never heard of any um, connection whatsoever. And look, from um, if you take what the Satmar Rebbe writes literally, I don't know how literally you take it, but if you take what he writes literally, the Rav is an Apikaris, like every other Zionist, he's an Apikaris. Uh, um, and uh, the Rav had, did not have positive things to say about what he called the Williamsburg mentality. Um, ben says, isn't there a financial cost to send half-empty planes to Israel borne by the taxpayers? I guess there is. Uh, I don't know what, uh, I don't know uh, the, if the planes were empty or not. I, um, I have a guy in my department, University of Scranton, he's not Jewish, but he goes to Israel a lot because he does stuff about Jewish-Christian relations. And um, I asked him, because he's flown Friday night. You can fly Friday night or Shabbos. It's a very different flight. Can you imagine? No religious Jews on it. I'm sure there's a lot more empty seats, but I, I bet you there's also people, Israelis, who Dafka choose to go on Friday night because then they don't have to put up with... Uh, you know, maybe the Mignonim or things like that. Uh, I'd love to have a camera to see what it looked like, uh, the, the Friday night uh, flight. But I so I don't know if those uh, flights are full or not full, but uh, um, he told me that uh, they're not empty. Uh, Nissen says, only Judaic scholars use CE as common era as in uh, BC. That's, no, no, that's not true, Nissen. Today, that's the politically correct term to use, that everyone in the academic world uses uh, CE and BCE, because that's the that's the, the neutral term. Uh, so no one, in no academic work or newspaper will, will write uh, AD or, uh, or BC. AD, Anno Domini, uh, you know, Year of Our Lord. Um, yes, and David says that the letters to Kirschbloom were written um, during the nine days. Um, well, some people don't like to travel in the nine days, but everyone assumes that if you're going to Eretz Yisrael, you can travel in the nine days. And I've traveled all over the world during the nine days. I was in Hungary in the nine days last year, and a whole group of Hasidim were there. They were going to some kever right in western Ukraine. So uh, there's uh, there's technically there's no problem traveling, although some people don't like to. But there's no sources really that say that you can't fly in an airplane during the nine days. Uh, yes, Mel says you're right. The letters he calls it Bein Hamitzarim. Uh, Um, I'm not coming to Borough Park on Shabbos. My son and his friend are coming. Uh, and you want to know, uh, uh, I, I kept telling my son, I took him to Borough Park, uh, showed him around. It's interesting uh, to see if you've never seen it. And he kept saying he wants to go, he wants to go. And then the commentator, the YU commentator, the current issue, there's a whole story there about a, a student 
who was driving and then his car broke down and he couldn't make it to where he was going to go. So he was near Kiryasio. So he went to Kiryasio and he had a wonderful welcome and he went back and he wrote a whole piece about it. And then uh, so my son, so I showed, my son said, uh, you know, now it's a good, I, I should have the experience also. Uh, and uh, the person he's staying with is a good friend of mine, or he's eating with a, a wonderful person who I think is going to have a very good influence on them. Because uh, people in the, in the modern Orthodox world, when I was young, I used to go to Borough Park for Shabbat homes. I went to the Bubba Varebi's Tish. I did all these things. I did already in elementary school. I would never let my kid in fifth grade. We would go by ourselves, Shabbat home. It was called Jep. And we'd walk around ourselves, uh, and uh, parents didn't, didn't have a problem with it. But I even was, went to Satmar. I, uh, I, I walked in the Satmar show, and uh, you know, people think of Satmar, they're not nice to you. This, and I can tell you, I walked in as a, like a ninth grader, looking the way I did, uh, into a Satmar show. Um, and uh, everyone was so friendly, and I ended up going. I used to go to Borough Park and only eat at the house I was at Friday night, knowing I can walk into any show and someone would invite me. So I've had uh, I've had only the greatest Akhmasas Orachim, not just in Satmar, in Borough Park, but in Kiryas Yoel and other places. So um, it's important for people to see that. Yes, that's a karma, Ben's Deli. A couple more things before we end. Um, um, so uh, Rabbi Sachs, Joan Sachs tells us the prosecutor's office in Philadelphia had a person who would check whether those who claimed the food business was kosher was telling the truth. Uh, listen, this goes back in New York. This goes back to the turn of the 20th century. They had these these officers. But um, and I, I guess if you leave out the constitutional issues, I guess it's a good thing because uh uh, the more people checking for kosher is, is good, but uh, the fact is that we cannot rely on this. This is not considered a reliable hashkacha, the state of New York, even if it's an Orthodox rabbi, because what do they come? They'll come uh, once every six months, and that's not, uh, but this this goes way back uh, in, in New York. Uh, they had this. Um, um, okay. Uh, uh, thank you all. Uh, Rabbi Kelvin, we have a big crowd tonight. So I'm glad you, we were yes, talking. Thank you very helpful. Tova Lichtenstein is a, an extraordinary human being and is a friend of mine. I've never met her. It's well worth spending some time with her. And she'll I would say, time. by the way, um, Zev Elif did a video with her because uh, he wrote a piece on uh, what would have happened had you know Ravar Lichtenstein stayed in America, like a counterfact historical piece. And he he did a whole hour with Tova discussing, and you get a sense in her understanding of American Orthodoxy, why they went to Israel, how things changed, yeah. things with her father. So uh very interesting. I guide um, you to that to that source and I'll leave you in peace. Yes, thank you. And one finally, Aaron Adver says that LL doesn't fly on Shabbos. LL now is a private uh, company owned by a religious uh uh family and uh, they will do their utmost to avoid Chilo Shabbos and his son Eitan Adler is a religious pilot for El Al people and all Shkayach on that that means I and I know another religious pilot or I met another religious pilot uh, not on El Al so uh, I can now testify to two Shomer Shabbos pilots uh, that I know of and I'm sure there, uh, there are many others so uh, Dr. Mark just to, I didn't realize now but that's of course Rabbi Adler who was the Shamash of the Rabbi living in Israel for many years, who wrote the book 70 Conversations. Exactly. Who's listening to us yes, right that's, now? That's, that's, because well, I, know okay, his son, well then, uh, I know his son is the pilot I, for Allah. I should Allah. say Rabbi Adler, who, so. uh, look, my. Uh, Rabbi Adler, you can say Shabbat hello if you want to unmute yourself. He is literary. Although I was, uh, I did help drive the Rav the last year, but Aaron Adler, and I can say to Rabbi Adler that next article in Hakira, I do quote a piece from your book. From one of your uh, conversations with the Rav, and I recommended that book to everyone. And I, Rabbi Adwar and I know each other for many years uh, will. Uh, by email, and we've met once or twice. So uh, I thank you very much. And he didn't identify himself, but uh, thank you, Rabbi yes. Hellman, I, for um, identifying that we're in the presence of someone who knew the Rav very well. And not only that, has uh, we thank everyone is thankful because of his recent book in which he records those numerous conversations he had with the Rav, uh, which are the sort of table talk that I mentioned, but so enlightening and um, 
So uh, thank you, Rabbi Adler. I, I, it's in Israel now. So well, I, I know David Eisen gets up, but, but if okay. you're in America, maybe that explains it. Thank you. You are in Israel, Rabbi. I will it's say- one quarter to five in the morning. Okay, you see, he got up early, but I will say a few months before COVID struck, we have Rabbi Adler, the pleasure of having him in our house uh, here, here in Toronto, and he gave a talk, it was actually at my sister's house for Shabbos, but we gave a talk, he gave a talk Friday night, so it's not recorded, and when it was meant to be, I don't know, 25 minutes, it was like an hour and 45 minutes, talking about stories of the Rav, and I, I told him at the time, you really have to get him to do this online, it was such a fascinating talk, just all the uh, personal connection, because he was... The Shamash of the rough for a number of years. Right, Rabbi Adler, I'm just uh maybe one time we'll we'll get you to sort of But you know, but you know that they all have great stories. Holzer has great stories, Chaim Jachter has great stories. I mean, uh, these people had a big zechus that they were able to be close to the Rav. That, look, I drove the Rav with Chaim Jachter just uh, in Boston, the Colo. So, I mean, I just had a couple of these interactions, but the people who were able to get close to the Rav, especially in his younger years, uh it, it's it's a life-changing uh, thing, and uh, I'm jealous of them. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, we look forward to next week, just if I can, a couple uh, other announcements outside of the rub now, just to let people know. I'll, I'll start with something that nobody knows because it was just finalized like five hours ago and not published, but uh, starting next Thursday, I believe, a week from this Thursday, Rabbi Adam Mintz will be giving a four-part series. He just came out with a book on the history of Aravine. That was his, you know, PhD, Rabbi Mintz. So he's going to give a four-part series of history of Aravine in North America, including one on the Toronto Aravim, of course, which uh, is a very interesting. Wait, let me just tell you, I've seen the book because I was in Dubai, and guess who was serving as the rabbi for a few weeks in Dubai just three weeks ago? Rabbi Adam Mintz. <laughs> so that will be. Uh, and we'll he brought the book with him. And tomorrow, tomorrow at 11 a.m., Dr. Moshe Sokolo is back after a while. Rabbi Adler, you might be interested to know, he'll be talking about the songs of the Chalutzim, an analysis of songs of the Chalutzim. We haven't put an end date to that. That's going to be sort of ongoing. We'll see. This. That's tomorrow at 11 a.m. Um, and then we have all our regular shiurim, but Rabbi Helfgott is not is not speaking this week, Wednesday night, um, but all the regular shiurim and uh, Parsha Shir is Rabbi... Uh, Daniel Fridman of the Teen Act Jewish Center. We're giving the first year Thursday and uh, regular shirim during the week. So, and Rabbi Litag will be starting a new series on Sunday on chronology in the Torah. All the debates about when the Torah is and isn't, and depending according to who in chronological order. So, uh, we look forward to learning with you. And uh, please bring a invite a friend and uh, always open to ideas and suggestions. And uh, we uh, like to hear from you. And uh, thank you very much. And everybody will, have a wonderful will night. Yossi Levine, will you? Yossi Levine be giving the Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Yossi Levine speaking, and I'm giving my class on the sitter, and uh, and Rabbi Schumann's giving class on the... I, I didn't mention all the regular shir we have. Yeah, yeah, everything God Just mentioned Rabbi Health God's not giving his shear this week. Um, this week and next week. Uh, he won't be giving the shear two weeks off, but um, we'll have all our regular shirim, yeah. So um, we, we we send them reminders before, but just to let everybody know. Okay, we'll look forward to seeing you and learning with you all soon, and everybody have a Laila Tov, and uh, thank you very much. Laila Tov. Hi, Nikki. Thank you. This was fantastic. Okay, everybody. Ashir Koloff, thank you so, so much. Okay, I think Dr. Mark left, but I'll uh, pass along the thanks and uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Okay.